When what you do every day impacts millions of lives and countless machines, you need to make sure it's right. Plant operators, engineers, and industrial business owners gain peace of mind when they choose Bentley Nevada. You see, Bentley Nevada helps solve challenges with data and visibility into assets across industries in power plants, oil and gas, mining, renewable energy, and industrials. Pioneering the path of efficiency, preventing problems from becoming catastrophes, and keeping our people, operations, and environment safe. Bentley Nevada helps you protect and manage your machinery plant-wide, inventing and building advanced sensors and equipment to meet the highest standards. With end-to-end -end knowledge of your systems, a dedicated partnership to design solutions for you, and System One software that turns data into valuable insights, helping you monitor, measure, and manage holistically. For safety, cybersecurity, maximum productivity, for taking action before it's too late, and reliability no matter what. This man and his team are confident that their assets are running safely and efficiently. They know they're prepared for whatever may lie ahead with technology that protects and provides peace of mind to the world's infrastructure. Because at the end of the day, that's what really matters. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining today's webinar for Bentley Nevada's Plant Wide. Thanks, Kim. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, and uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, for our time together this, this morning, well, it's morning my time, uh, for our time together today, we're going to talk about how we can help solve some of these industry challenges. Now, you're going to see a lot of figures placed on the screen. Th these aren't necessarily our figures. These are figures that have come to us from various industry consultants over the last couple of years, and more importantly, figures from a lot of our customers. And so, in general, what we're hearing out in the marketplace is that, you know, there's, there's an, on average, a goal to, to reduce operating expenses on the order of about 20% compared to what they were, say, a year ago, if, if we use uh, the, the pre-COVID economy as our, as our starting point. There's a there's an expectation that that something on the order of 50% of the current workforce is anticipated to retire uh, within the next five to ten years, and unfortunately, transferring knowledge and experience, at least in some of the industries that that I've visited over the last few years, isn't quite going as well as a lot of people would hope. Companies have have targets of you know less than three to five percent for lost productivity due to unexpected events and, and of course, you know, an, an unexpected failure of, of something in service is typically significantly more expensive to repair, replace, and restore to service than something that, that has been planned. And the other thing that we're seeing is, is companies are investing more in digital technologies. Uh, the investment is increasing but what that does is that brings an awful lot of data together that, that hopefully doesn't get stranded in some you know, massive data lake somewhere. We need to be in a position, hopefully, to take this data and, and assimilate it and get some useful information out of these gobs and gobs of data that are being collected and in some cases stored. And the bad news is what, what ends up happening a lot is in spite of, of well-connected machines, instruments, and systems, we do tend to strand an awful lot of the data and, and valuable information that we could be taking advantage of. So with that said, I think it's a, it's a fair statement that, that the power of the data that's being acquired on our uh, process machinery really is not being fully taken advantage of at this point. We recognize that, that most of our customers have a really good understanding of, of their fleet of, of machines, how they operate, you know, how they're supposed to run, how they're built, things like that. But that information is often fragmented, not only fragmented from one facility to another, but, but the information that, that's needed is often fragmented even uh, within within the fence, you know, within the confines of a particular facility. The knowledge that's built up takes a long time to build up. It's generally 
It's generally coming in relatively slowly. And the insights that we gain from these, from the slow knowledge buildup are also slow to deploy and often very difficult to scale. Your priorities may not be the same as, as the person next to you's priorities. And it's hard to put the, these together without conflicting with other departmental needs. I mean, the reliability team may have one set of focuses, production another, and, and management and accounting are, are looking at something, you know, even different yet. But when we're talking about making sure that, that our production assets are in the right kind of shape and the right position to do the things that we invested in them to do, to produce the product that we expect them to do, to produce within three terms, literally, they can produce on demand at capacity and within quality standards. If we're going to be taking a look at making sure that, that those three attributes can be met by our production machinery, it really is time to consider a plant-wide condition monitoring program to help you recognize that things are in the position to produce on demand at capacity and within quality standards. If not, why not? What do we need to do about it? But of course, if they are, that knowledge and, and verifiable information gives us the confidence that we can operate our facilities and meet the financial objectives that, that the, were expected when the initial investments were made. So when I say it's time for a condition monitoring and evaluation program to cover your, your plant-wide assets, I want to kind of bring us to a common baseline for the rest of the discussion today as to what condition monitoring is really good for. From my perspective, having been uh, you know, a practitioner and a supplier in the condition monitoring market space for more years than I care to admit to, there's basically two things that we expect from condition monitoring. One, we need to identify the specific challenges or potential problems that are associated with the machines that are in our care. And number two, we need to use condition monitoring as a planning tool. Again, I can tell you from experience that, that in the late 1980s, early 1990s, when vibration-based condition monitoring really started gaining a foothold, people would see us wandering around the plant with our portable data collectors and our instrumentation, and they'd kind of look at us like, you know, these guys are wizards. They're going out and they're, they're taking measurements on machines and they're diagnosing them and they're, and they're telling us what's wrong. And back in those days, it was, it was very popular to say, guess what? I took this data, I found this problem, I saved the machine. Well, I can tell you that that more often than not, when I took data on a machine back in those days and walked into the maintenance superintendent's office, he didn't want to hear that, that I thought I'd saved anything because from his perspective, all I was doing was, was costing him money, causing him to take actions that he might not otherwise have taken. So over the years, condition monitoring has developed and matured from only identifying problems to being able to be used more as a planning tool than anything else. And from my perspective and experience, using condition monitoring as a planning tool is really where the, the major benefits are achieved. Because ideally, a properly implemented condition monitoring system should be able to recognize not only the fact that, that there's a problem with the machine, but some root cause failure mechanism is in play. And we need to be able to recognize the fact that that root cause failure mechanism is in play at the earliest possible opportunity. We also obviously need to be able to recognize from the purely predictive maintenance perspective that some damage has occurred. And we wanna know that as soon as or as quickly after it has started as we possibly can. And our goal is to get to that and get it understood so that hopefully we can address it before functional failure. And I define functional failure in those same terms I mentioned a few minutes ago as the inability to produce on-demand at capacity or within quality standards 
to me, there don't have to be bits of metal flying around the room because the machine's tearing itself apart for it to be functionally failed. But I think more important in the long run, if we do it right, condition monitoring really is a planning tool more than anything else. Because hopefully a, a, a thorough comprehensive program will provide data that helps answer the three questions that are on the bottom right-hand corner of the screen right now. What's wrong? Can I continue to run? Or what do we need to do about this particular issue? And when do we need to do it? I like to talk a little bit about uh, John Mulgray's PF curve, which was originally published uh, back in the late 1990s. And if we, if we look at it from the perspective that Mowbray first published, we're really only looking at the right-hand portion of the curve, where some physical damage starts, the functional health of the machine starts to degrade over time, but hopefully before we get to functional failure, we're able to recognize what Mowbray called point P, which point P is the first indication that you can get that something's wrong that damage is present and is progressing based on an objective measurement or observation. The key here is objective in terms of something that it's not an opinion, it's, it's kind of a fact. It's, you know, this parameter is out of spec or, you know, this problem has been observed. And these are the methods that basically started out, you know, the whole concept of predictive maintenance predicting that something is going to fail at some point in the future because we recognize that the damage has already started. However, there's a lot more to it than that. So that if we go to the left of the point on the curve where the damage actually starts, everything's good at the beginning. You know, functional health is, is right up there where it needs to be. You've got a new or a newly rebuilt machine with no real damage, no degradation. But then over time, it, it moves to the right into that kind of green blue transition zone that you see and somewhere in there there's a there's a point that that's a proactive point p where again through objective measurements and observations we should be able to recognize that damage causing conditions exist and what i propose is that if you can recognize that damage causing conditions are in play then hopefully they can be addressed before you get to the point where the actual damage starts and this is where taking condition monitoring beyond just the typical vibration, you know, taking vibration readings periodically with a portable data collector or even with, a, with an online condition monitoring system really come into play so that we can understand what's going on with the system at a more holistic level. Things that are important to keep in mind as we're, as we're thinking about these are the fact that there are multiple failure modes, and each failure mode has its own progression rate. We need to think in terms of the cost consequences of the failure if and when it happens, and factor that in with proper planning. You know, plan for the availability and the need for replacement parts. But again, always keep in mind the criticality of the asset and the value of the asset to the production process, and, and use that to help guide through how you're going to address keeping it in, in its, you know, optimum functional health or its optimum operating condition. But we also need to recognize that, that different machines require different strategies and potentially different technologies. It's not always the right answer to apply vibration only or thermography only or lube oil analysis only or process parameter monitoring only but it takes kind of a holistic approach with all these technologies to look at the different, the different issues. Now, one of the things that's, that's pretty common is, is the more expensive, the higher value or the higher cost machines are typically machines that are monitored uh, quite extensively. I've got some examples here of the cost consequences of unexpected downtime. And I'm not going to read these to you because, you know, you can certainly, you know, read them for yourself on a screen. But there's one thing that I would like to point out that, that all of these are. This is just the cost 
of lost productivity. This has nothing to do with the cost of repair or replacement, which of course adds to this. But the thing that, that strikes me the most, and these are actual numbers that, were, that have been given to me by customers over the years, and you know, please respect the fact that, that I was given these numbers and told I could share them provided I did not name the actual customer that, that they came to me from. But what's really important is that none of the machines that brought the plants down that resulted in these lost productivity figures that I was given were machines that were considered quote unquote critical. They weren't like in the, in the power plant at the top of the list. It was not the main steam turbine generator that went, that went down. It was a piece of auxiliary equipment that caused that plant to have to go down for an entire week. A significant number of these machines are also single stream machines in single stream processes that don't have redundancy. And when you have a situation like that, basically every machine from the start, you know, from, from bringing the raw material into the facility until the final product goes out the door, just about any machine in that stream, if it goes down, brings the whole process to its knees. And so these are things that we need to be considering and things that we need to, to think about when we're trying to focus on where do we apply our condition monitoring uh, budget. When it comes to getting started with a proper condition monitoring program, it all starts with understanding your machinery, how it's built, how it's put together, how it's supposed to run, and the various interactions between the components and the systems and, and the subsystems. So really the first step is making sure that you've got all the right sensors in place, which, you know, as a, as a company that for many years has been vibration focused, we'd like to say, you know, accelerometers, proximity probes, things like that. But, but just as important are the process monitoring instruments, you know, temperature measuring devices, pressures, being able to measure flow, current, voltages. These are all equally important in, and, and really give a lot of added value when you integrate them with your dedicated condition monitoring focused uh, focused sensors and instrumentation. Once the sensors are in place, we need to obviously connect it up to certain instrumentation, which could be dedicated condition monitoring, or could just as easily be the process control um, and automation system. And again, keep in mind that that not all assets are created equally, and so different assets will require different sensor packages and, and different approaches uh, in order to monitor them most effectively. Once the sensors and the instrumentation are all in place, then it's time to start monitoring the data. We monitor vibration, we monitor position, speeds, temperatures, pressures, flows, all of these things are important when it comes to really understanding what's going on with your, with your production machine. And in a lot of cases, if we, if we simplify it to a change in vibration, for example, all changes in vibration aren't necessarily bad, but if you don't know what's going on with the process or what else is going on with the machine, how can you, how can you tell? Or even more important, how can you recognize that, oh, I just changed something that's causing a challenge to this machine, maybe I need to change it back or do something a little bit differently in order to not put the machine in a state of, of distress that could lead it to failure. And it's, again, it's focusing on the ability to see and to recognize root cause failure mechanisms in process. Uh, a few minutes from now, uh, my colleague Jackie is going to talk about uh, the visual, the software and, and how we can visualize what's going on. But before we get to that point, the last thing that I'm going to say at this, at this stage is the instrumentation, the sensors are in place. It's time to start monitoring the machines from the dedicated condition monitoring instruments that you see on the left-hand side to bringing in data from the process control system and, and other process measurements on the right-hand side. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Chris McMillan, and Chris is going to talk about uh, instrumentation. Chris, over to you. Hey, thanks, Bob. You know, folks on the phone, and thanks for joining again, of course, but certainly now that Bob and, and Kim have given us a, a great overview of, you know, certainly kind of what condition monitoring is and the, the tremendous value, 
that can be obtained from that. You know, it's a lot about data collection and doing something with that data going forward, but it really stems down to at least one of the fundamental pieces that deserves credit here, or what are the solutions today available just to collect that data, you know, that's coming through to make those actionable decisions coming forward. Uh, and we break these down really into, into three kind of key categories that I'll cover here quickly. You know, one, most folks are, are most likely familiar here are what we call online monitoring solutions. You know, these are supported by a wide variety of sensors. Typically, these are hardwired sensors, um, you know, vibration, temperature, process, you know, flow, pressures, all kinds of different sensors coming through into some means of whether it's a distributed system that's kind of distributed throughout your plant or, or on a skid, or sometimes these uh, online systems can be, you know, rack-based or centrally located uh, out there. Uh, a lot of these monitoring systems today that you're looking into, not only do they provide the condition monitoring aspect, the focus of this talk, of course, but certainly some of these are really uh, or can be enabled for protection where they physically, you know, receive an input automatically and maybe drive a signal back into a control system or driver relay that shuts a couple of things down. A couple of just real quick considerations here as you look at online monitoring solutions, of course, you know, certainly look at the assets or the process uh, and the overall value, of course, to the plant or the operations. But consider the scalability um, when you when you talk about an online system. Is it, you know, is this system going to be able to handle the inputs you're looking for today? And then, you know, how well is it supported uh, in the future? And that kind of goes hand in hand with the expandability and flexibility. You know, are you limited to just vibration inputs or are you looking to bring in other types of uh, sensor inputs as well? So we're going to transition on quickly here to the next modalities here, one of my favorites, is, which is wireless, which is an, a fairly new technology that started to grab the condition monitoring world and gain more and more acceptance, as well as, our, as well as portable solutions that are out there. Obviously, by definition, you know, wireless implies less wires. Typically, there are always still some wires involved because you do still have to have some means of typically a gateway. But typically, as you can see, these are, you know, wire, wireless sensors um, still considered online right, because they're continuously monitoring, just, you know, the data is not coming through quite, quite as often. Uh, and then most typical applications that are out there, uh, you know, or installations are on medium, medium to lower maybe process or asset risk um, uh, units that are out there for that. Quite, quite frankly, they're very highly flexible, of course. You can monitor a wide variety of applications with, with wireless. When you are considering a wireless solution, whether you have a solution today or you're looking to deploy wireless into your plant today, you know, there's multiple different considerations out there, but I'd probably list these three uh, that you see here on the page here as the top three to consider making any selection. You know, certainly one is range. You know, not only what is the, what is the distance, you know, not only between the asset or the device you're trying to measure uh, and, the, and the gateway or data collection point that has to travel wirelessly uh, is critical. To, you know, what kind of data are you looking to get across and what kind of bandwidth? You know, in the vibration world, you know, is it an overall value only that you're looking at or is it a spectrum and a waveform that you're looking at? And as you look at various different protocols and you consider range, you know, you'll be needing to evaluate the trade-offs between the, the, two, the two that are out there. And the last one that's always a consideration or must be a consideration that can sometimes be overlooked is the power source. Uh, you know, these are wireless transducers that are typically out there. Are these battery powered? If they are going to be battery powered, you know, then hey, that's fantastic. What's the battery life in a typical application? But we still need to, you know, put into consideration, you know, what's what's the maintenance cycle? I mean, those batteries, you know, if they are interchangeable, you're going to have to put in some sort of maintenance program, you know, to monitor the health of those batteries and replace those. So wireless has a great play. On the other hand side, I think Bob, you know, you talked about it earlier, you know, in its heyday really portables was the foundation. That's where condition monitoring got its start. You know, that's a human operator walking around collecting data. Uh, sometimes they're data collections that's sent to a central repository, of course, for further analysis, or they could be used, for, you know, for on-site in situ uh, analysis that's going on. You know, these data handheld analyzers, you know, they're route-based. So, you, again, you have a human operator walking around. Data is right there at your fingertips. But, again, you are limited. They are a bit more periodic. Uh, because you do have a human, so the asset is not necessarily going to be continuous data coming through. Typical route bases, you know, you're looking at a reading about once once a month or so is, is typical. Of course, that any uh, reliability program can change that. Just a couple of the, the considerations when leveraging any sort of portable walk-around program is, you know, what's the environment that the operator 
or the technician or whomever is uh, leveraging this data, what, what's the operating environment they're in, right? Is it a hazardous area? Therefore, obviously, your instrumentation needs to be hazardous rated. Uh, you know, is there a safety issue? Does he have to climb up ladders, et cetera, coming forward? So just a consideration for that one. Uh, the next one, you know, I talk about route rigor and measurement repeatability. You know, there's methods around this, but talking about route rigor is how often is that asset being measured? And is that asset, you know, does it have a permanently mounted transducer or sensor that you're connecting to the same spot in the same orientation every time? Or is it uh, kind of a spot-based measurement? So data, data repeatability um, can come, come into play here with a, with a portable route. And then, of course, battery life, right? You know, any, any portable data collector, if you're out there, especially anyone that's doing, you know, a route-based walk-around, uh, you want to make sure that the unit has sufficient battery life to to enable the the route to be fully completed versus having to uh, having to come into another and get another battery source coming forward. And lastly, you know, just in quick summary, you know, Bob said it earlier. I'm going to reinforce the point here. There is no one solution that fits all. Right? You know, wired, portables, and wireless all have a play. I think they're all quite complementary in any reliability program. They all have their strengths and their advantages, and they complement each other's going forward. And you can see the bullets on the on the left-hand side here with wired. Obviously, it's uh, very high. You can get quite high point counts and, and higher sampling rates. Typically, those are involved, again, as I said earlier, on the higher higher criticality assets or, or criticality to the process conditions. You know, your wireless, which is gaining ground in industry, uh, mainly because of its it's ease of deployment, quite easy to expand. It can be quite cost effective because, you're, again, you're not running the infrastructure of hard wires going everywhere. And then portables. You know, portables still has a play. You know, the human element, see, touch, smell. You know, having an operator or having a, 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 an individual walking around, you know, a wired solution or a wireless solution, as much as we like to use the term smart, you know, they're really, you know, not going to know right next door if something is, is, uh, is amiss, right? They're going to be monitoring the situation that they're looked to monitor and nothing around. So having that human uh, walk around, you know, and maybe notice a few different things and come back to it still has a, has a play here. So again, depending on your level uh, of and where you're at in that condition monitoring journey, you know, all of these solutions have a play in your plants. All of these solutions are quite complementary uh, and can be leveraged once another. So Bob has provided a nice foundation of the methodology of condition monitoring. And Chris talked through the sensors and the monitors that allow you to start uh, attaching to your assets and collecting some of that data. But when we talk to customers, which we do all the time here at Bentley Nevada, something they bring up a lot is, okay, so we have the data, we're collecting it, but often it's in pockets or silos. So their teams, when they're trying to monitor the health of their assets, they're having to jump between different tools and different technologies to try to get the holistic picture of the health of their industrial process. And they pose the question to us, why can't we just have this one system that we can go to that allows us to see the health of all of our assets collectively? And really what they're asking for is plant-wide condition monitoring. So a plant-wide condition monitoring platform, like System 1 from Bentley Nevada, does just that. So like Chris talked about with Bentley monitors, it can collect that really rich waveform vibration data and store it as part of its historian. But it can also connect to the process data, the control system data, the emissions data directly off of the PLC or from another process historian and store it together with the vibration data. And that's really powerful because then you have that rich waveform data side by side and time correlated with 200 millisecond Modbus data directly off the PLC, which is allowing you to get more of a holistic look at the health of all of those assets. And it truly is plant-wide at that point. You're rotating machines, you're reciprocating assets, fixed assets, Wherever you have sensors that are monitoring those, uh, that, that equipment in your process, all of that can come together into a single platform. In those discussions with customers, when you start talking about something like this, there's always the but. And the but that comes up is, well, that's great, but that's a lot of data. And what do I do with all of that data? And oftentimes, we have expertise, but 
those people with the expertise are retiring or we're being asked to do more with less. So we have fewer people that are looking at more assets than they ever have before. So having a lot of data is great, but I don't know how to parse through it all to really understand what's going on. And that's where analytics come into play. And this is obviously a very buzzy thing right now in asset management, but it is critical because it's allowing you to extract those insights from the data set to understand where to focus your attention when you're doing condition monitoring. Now, the power of having a plant-wide data set is that you're not just trying to extract insights from vibration. You're extracting insights from the correlation of that vibration data with the process data and with the control system data. A product like Decision Support, which pairs with System 1, allows users to really codify their expertise of their machines to combine these data parameters that they're collecting to get more advanced insights out of that data to drive their work. And what's nice about something like decision support is that it also enables customers to take advantage of the 60 years of Bentley Nevada expertise. So we've embedded our domain knowledge into decision support to be able to detect faults like rotor imbalance and seal oil issues that users can use to be more proactive about their machinery monitoring. So instead of trying to wade through all of this data and just hopefully come upon something that is showing that there's an issue with the machine, you can have that advanced notification and then really focus in on the high priority issues. Again, there's always a but. So then they would say at this point, when I talk to customers is, analytics are, are great, but we're not ready to have a human not in the loop. We need a human in the loop that is able to at least look at these insights that you're providing to be able to confirm them and do the diagnostics that are necessary to confirm the condition of the machine. And that's really where the visualization layer comes in of a condition monitoring platform like System 1. So you're getting the notifications from all of that rich plant-wide data, and you're able to visualize that within a single pane of glass. System 1 allows you with its HMI view to not just focus on a single asset and mechanical or vibration parameters, but allows you to look at that asset in the context of the system in which it's operating, alongside the process data and the control data. And from there, users can prioritize their work. So they can come in based off of a notification from an analytic, and they can start diving in. They can compare the data that triggered that analytic with other supporting data to try to confirm if the fault that was detected is truly an issue. And then, of course, an important aspect of this is, is tracking that asset health over time. So you want to make sure that you're able to uh, embed uh, reports and reviews and notes alongside this so that you can collaborate uh, with the other members of your team. And that's really the other end of condition monitoring. We started off talking about plant-wide as far as collecting all of that data and trying to get it into a single central place. But when you're monitoring machines over time, it's just as important to collect your condition monitoring artifacts in a single place. So instead of having reports that are stored on someone's computer or an email that went out to someone and it's lost over time. What you want to be able to do is embed those artifacts so that you can truly have a holistic understanding of how that machine's health has changed over time. So when we break it down that way, that's really breaking down the three pillars that make up a condition monitoring platform like System 1. There's the connectivity aspect, which we've talked about at great lengths, the sensors, the monitors, uh, the process data, all of it coming together very, very high resolution data. But like we said, there's immense quantities of data at that point. So it's important to be able to analyze that data, to be able to extract the insights from it, to understand how to focus and prioritize where you are uh, putting your attention as a reliability or condition monitoring engineer. And then finally, having a rich set of tools to visualize that. So what are the insights that I have available to me right now? How do I confirm that it is truly a condition with the machine that I need to investigate further? And then how do I uh, 
maintain the information that I've gained from this as part of a case management and drive work to the operations team or the maintenance team to ensure that we proactively address issues if needed before they become a real problem. And like Bob said, if issues get to the point of um, causing a shutdown or another critical issue within the plant, obviously the, the, the cost or the money associated with that is, is quite extreme. So we always want to, as part of a condition monitoring program, try to be as proactive as possible and make sure that we address any issues before we get to that point. Sounds great. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody once again for participating in the webinar. Uh, please take time to fill out the survey. You will be getting a, an email back with all of the resources available, and we appreciate you joining today. Uh, Plant-wide condition monitoring program is definitely a hot topic, and we're definitely hearing customers want to get more machines, more data, and more insights. Thank you again for joining today's presentation.